Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, my name is Addy Addison, or you may know me as Addisons or Indigenous Unity. Today is going to be my, uh, this is my second recording, by the way. This is my first attempt at uh, making a podcast. And I don't know where to begin. Let's see. Well, for the last couple of years, I've gotten a lot of people who wanted me to, to make a podcast or do some kind of dialogue you know, about the things I've posted about online, speaking about all different types of topics, and I always never knew how to to go about that. And it wasn't until recently that I started listening to podcasts myself that really got me thinking about seriously starting one, finally. So I guess here I am. Um... I guess one good way to begin is just to to start with my personal story. Uh, I think that's what this episode is going to be about. It's just where where I came along as far as my identity and how my Instagram life started. (laughs) So, let's see. Um, I was born in 1992. I just turned uh, 27 uh, in West Covina, California. Uh, from two Chicano parents, Mestizo parents. Uh, my mother was never in my life. My dad raised me. Uh, about two years after I was born, we moved to Washington State, so my dad could raise me in a better place. I spent most of my life here. I've, I've moved back to California, and I've lived in Arkansas for a little bit, but for the most part, Washington is where I'm at. For the longest time, I could remember my father telling me, we're brown and we're proud. We are Chicano. We're Mexican-American. So that is the beginning of what I understood about my identity growing up. And that was probably about four or five years old. A few years later, uh, my dad met a woman, and she also had a kid. And she's African-American, a black woman. And that's when I started to really learn more about race and identity. Uh, They got married. They had a couple of kids of their own. And so I experienced what it was like to live in a biracial family, a blended family, you know, a mixed family. And that taught me a lot. In Washington State, the area that I'm from has always been very diverse. Uh... There was a time when we moved to uh, Oregon, uh, not Oregon, uh, Arkansas. And that's when I also started to see a really different dynamic as far as race. The South still has a lot of catching up to do when it comes to that. And even in the early 2000s in elementary school, I saw that firsthand. Um, The white kids sat in the front, the black kids sat in the back. The light-skinned and different race kids sat in the middle I sat next to some Asian kids and some lighter skinned kids and for them this was normal but I think because I came from an area where kids could sit wherever they wanted I noticed something was different and after after a while we moved back to Washington and my identity it pretty much stayed the same until I went to high school Then I started thinking more critically about what it means to be Chicano, what it means to be a person of color. As I was applying for scholarships, you know, doing surveys, filling out forms, it would ask me what my race is. And it would only give me four options. It would give me white, black, Asian, or Native American. It wouldn't even have a spot for Latino or Hispanic. That was was after So, thinking about my race in that terms, I would always click Native American just because I felt, well, as far as looks go, I felt like Mexican people looked more closely to Native Americans than any other race. And also the fact that Mexican people were Native to America, so that was my reasoning as a teenager. So, fast forward a couple more years, I... um, went to Washington State University. Um, 
I was on scholarships, grants, and some help from my tia uh, financially. And that's where I started to really awaken my knowledge and my identity. Growing up, I always wanted to be a social worker or a counselor, something that was community-oriented. So that was those classes that I decided to take. I majored in comparative ethnic studies. I took the Chicano course, the African-American course, and the Native Studies course, and then the general you know, the general courses. And this is where I really, I felt like I thrived. Uh, I was always good at at writing in English and and those subjects in high school. And then when it came to these subjects about race and identity, it was, it was so, I wouldn't say easy, but it was something I enjoyed. And if you do something that you enjoy, it's going to come a lot easier to you. Um, I would just always be active in the class discussions and, you know, in the reading material. And I would go above and beyond in writing my essays. And that part really jump started where I am. After two years of college, uh, I couldn't afford to go to college anymore. So I dropped out and I came back home. And this is about 2012, 2013. And I came back home and <clears throat> I still wanted to continue learning because I had that, that the urge to learn to know more. And I always thought, well, I, I have the internet, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't go to college anymore, but the internet has a lot of this information. And this is before Instagram was prominent. This is more of like the Tumblr era. So that's where I I began. Um, You know, Tumblr always gets this bad rap for being a social justice warrior. You know, all this kind of stuff. And for the most part, yeah, it's it's true. But also, a lot of it gets a bad name for good intentions. You know, Uh, I feel like a lot of the times the radical people are the ones who get put in the spotlight for the ideas that that they try to promote that are really ideas that should be spoken about but it's just you get the people that are over the top and and like aggressive with it that are the ones that the little ones that get spoken about when these subjects come up uh anyway i would I would engage in conversations, I would repost certain things, you know, regarding these topics of race and identity in America. Um, So after a while of being on social media, I I started to get really, like, just tired of seeing the same old, same old stuff. Every time I refresh my feed, I would see friends just taking selfies and friends taking pictures of their food and you know all these different things that really didn't amount to anything in the long run and it would frustrate me so i decided i can control how how i see my my social media life you can control what you see by what you follow so i went i went to instagram i went to tumblr i went to twitter and facebook and I just started following a bunch of news sources. I started following a bunch of um, just different outlets for different subjects. So I followed all of the the news, like ABC News, NBC, CNN, um, BBC, Al Jazeera. You know, I, like everything I could on all my social media networks. I also followed other things that that held my interest. Like I really love science and astronomy, so. I follow NASA's Instagram, you know, their their news page, and I'm interested in art and music, and so I'd follow pages like that. And then when it came to, like, community, it came back to, well, what am I? And, you know, I'm, I'm Chicano, I'm Mexican-American, and I'm a person of color in America, so... I would go on all the social medias and I would start following more Chicanos and I would just go on the search bar, I would type in Chicano in every way that you can type Chicano 
and I would just follow all the, the accounts that were there. I would, you know, follow Mexican American pages. I would follow, you know, person of color pages. I would, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I would go on those pages and, and I would click their followers and I would click who they're following and I would start following all those pages. And I just wanted to build my network and that's how I did it. And, you know, within the next day, I would refresh my, my feed and it would be so different. No longer was I seeing the same old, same old friends. But now I was given a window into all these different individual people and their lives and what they chose to share. And for me, that was such a unique experience. I was able to see these random strangers. And <laughs> that might sound creepy, but just, you know, what it's like living where they're at. Some of them could be living in Florida. Some of them could be living, you know, South America. Some of them could be living in, in Sweden, you know. And I just get to just get to look at how they live as Chicanos, as Mexican American, as, you know, wherever they're at in their experience. And eventually, I would put myself in conversations with certain pages who like to have dialogues. And then I came across this particular group who, they're very dogmatic and they like to recruit people. And they have very specific ideas about what identity is and all that stuff. And they're, they're, they're called um, the Mexica Movement. You might have heard of them. And they're very, I would say radical, but I don't know if that's the right word. Let's just say they're they're an extreme group in that sense. And I will credit them for awakening a lot of our relatives up when it comes to starting to decolonize, when it starts to come to saying no to the Hispanic and Latino labels, the mestizo labels. And that's what they did for me. Just seeing their posts, their pages, their propaganda. And, you know, like any other young Chicano person, I followed the pages and participated in the dialogue. And for me, it was, it was helpful. But then I always had this feeling that they are not all they're cracked up to be and I noticed that because some of the stuff and the tone and the way they, they speak about things just didn't sit right with me and one day I would see they posted something that said uh, you're either Nikantlaka or you're not you can, you, there's no other identities you can claim now Nikantlaka is an uh, identity that was um in the Nawa language, which they say means we the people here. And so that's their identity term that they prefer to use instead of indigenous, Native American, you know, Indian, whatever. That's that's their brand. And that's a whole other subject. But basically what they're saying is that you only can claim that you're Nikantlaka. You can't claim any other identities. And so that didn't sit right with me. I asked them, I said, you know, well, where does that leave our biracial relatives? You know, people who are African-American and Mexican-American, you know, like my family. And they basically just said, you know, there's no room for other identities. You have to, you have to claim Nikantlaka or you're not one of us. So I, I disagreed with that and... I did not want to take that as an answer. And so I I stood up to them and I disagree with them. And you guys know me. I, I screenshot and then I post the conversation and I spoke on why I think that's not okay, why I think that's wrong. So I, I stuck up to the group of people who helped wake me up in my identity. And in the beginning, it was kind of scary because I felt, well, if I'm going to turn my backs on these people, then how else am I going to continue to learn? But that's not how you should think, because if you know something is wrong, you should speak up against it. And that's what I did. And, of course, I put a target on my back because of that from those people. And 
to this day i'm never i'm never welcome in those circles not that i want to be but you know that's just how it is and uh there's these other groups of people this other circle in this quote unquote native american decolonized community that have found me because i was posting and sticking up against the Mashika movement and so I started following them and they started participating in dialogues with me and I don't want to be messy but I'm going to go ahead and say it because people need to know this is a page called Native Faces this is a page called Native Olmec um, they're the prominent ones and they have they have a bunch of their friends and or whatever lesser pages like this guy named Marco, this other guy, Nana, and and so forth. But anyways, I was basically consuming information from their pages now that I disassociated myself with the Mashika movement. And something still did not sit right with them. And that came from the idea of ethnocentrism. Now, ethnocentrism is 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 a, very, is a very prominent issue in the Native American community online, and one form of it is well, it comes in many forms, but the idea that um, black people, African American people, were always here in America; they were never slaves. They were not brought here by Europeans. They've been here before 1492. That they are the real and true Native Americans. And the people that think they're Native Americans are really just uh, hybrid, mongoloid, half-breed, $5 Indian, you know, fake, Asian, white, whatever they want to call us. That's what they believe. They believe that they're the true Natives and we're the fake ones. Um, and that's so problematic and inappropriate, but the the point I'm trying to make is that these groups of people will try to sit there and act like um, they're real and we're fake. And the, now this group of people, the Native Faces and his friends, they don't like it for obvious reasons. And the way they go about debunking and, and criticizing and responding to this ethnocentrism um, is very problematic and racist anti-black and me I immediately saw that and I called it out just like I called out the Mexica movement and I got the same type of backlash as I got when I sp spoke up against the Mexica movement they you know immediately turned on me and said that I was you know, rolling over for black people and I'm an apologist and I support Afrocentrism, which, by the way, the topic on what Afrocentrism really is is also a subject for a whole nother podcast. But for now, just note that Afrocentrism is, does, does not equate to ethnocentrism or the stealing of identities for Native people. Um, but anyways... You know, the the native faces and his friends, that circle of of people, they turned they turned on me, which is fine because I don't agree with what they say, and it's just that they they will be anti black and they will be homophobic and all this stuff, but they're they're smarter than the average uh, bigot because they know how to do it in a way that is passive aggressive or in a way that is enabling without being outwards to be able to be called out. So they basically know how to walk around the landmines, but still letting people know where they stand, if that makes sense. Um, so now I was in this place where <laughs> I started to feel alienated, but I started following, you know, just like I did with the Mashika movement, um, I started following the people that follow them and, you know, follow the people they follow. And so I started to gain my own friend group within 
in the uh, I guess this is like my third wave of of decolonization you know first it started with the Mashiga movement and then it started with these racist dudes native faces and friends and then I came across I came across like these these this these few friends that I'm still good friends with today um like this the page is called like indigenous pride um indigenous empowerment um they're they're really good friends and you know I started learning from them and for the most part like I I could not find anything wrong with them so I said you know what this is where I'm going to be now because these people are not homophobic these people are anti-black I can learn from them because they're more open and so that's what I just I just you know continued on and let's see another part of that is a couple years ago and this is all in 2015 2014 um there was this page her name it was all hail satin and <laughs> i don't know if any of you remember or were on instagram at that time but she was a white girl who was pretending to be native and she had like over 30,000 followers and she was spreading a lot of bullshit on on her page a lot of stuff that didn't make any sense um so i forgot who i think it was like native faces or you know they they all hated her and all that stuff and they had sent some people to ask me to help them take down her page or like at least call her out you know and expose her for what she is and so i I participated in that and we you know we made hashtags called um what are you satin or satin exposed and exposed satin and you can still click those hashtags today to find out the true tea but that's what we did we we had a lot of screenshots a lot of um receipts people would take screenshots of all the stuff she would talk about pretending to be native and watch how it all contradicted itself and then we would call her out on it like i remember she used to say oh i'm half native my dad is 100 percent maya and you know there's another receipt that her said she said oh i grew up on the reservation in arizona but then there was another screenshot of her saying, I, I used to call myself Latina, but now I know I'm Nicantlaca. And all those things did not make sense because if your dad is 100% Maya from Mexico, then you would never call yourself Latina. You would not call yourself um, Nicantlaca. And, you know, you you would also not be from a reservation in Arizona. So immediately we had the receipts to call her out on her bullshit and she eventually deactivated her page. Uh, but throughout this whole debacle, I would be posting all the receipts and the hashtags and all that stuff. And so I went from a regular page having like 500 followers to I, I gained like 2,000 followers in a week and that was something else. I was kind of shocked by it. And then I realized I have more influence now. And I felt like I had more responsibility. I mean, I only had like 2,500 followers. But to me, that was like, whoa, what do I do with this now? So I wanted to start posting more meaningful information. Um, So that's pretty much where that started. And it kind of just started building more and more from there. But... um, so yeah, like you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a trip being on Instagram and seeing all this stuff unfold over the years. But let's see. I guess another thing I want to talk about is the the conversation about um, who can reclaim indigenous, you know, and what is our place in in the community. Because especially lately, I mean, this is a conversation that's that we've been having for years, and we will continue to have for you a polarizing topic in the community. 
because everyone wants to be the judge and gatekeep and and have the ideas about what it means and what it is to be indigenous. So I'll just give you my point of view and my experience from what you've already known and what I'm going to tell you about myself. From what I feel is that if you, like, quote-unquote, a mestizo, a majority of your blood is indigenous, I feel like you have every right to reclaim your identity as a native person. I feel that if we want to talk about how white supremacy and colonialism affects people of color, especially African American and indigenous people, that we should not be supporting people upholding and identifying with those colonial systems, which includes the caste system, the system that calls us mestizos. That's where it comes from. Or or other colonial labels such as Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, or even nationalities such as, as you know, Cubano, Mexicano, all those things. How can we tell our people to uphold those identities if we want to decolonize or understand how colonialism affects our indigenous and African relatives? You know what I'm saying? So for that reason alone, I feel like if people want to disassociate with the idea of being a mestizo, that's reason enough. Um... We shouldn't be using blood quantum to to judge people who can and cannot be indigenous. But the fact is, is if more than or if if half of your blood is indigenous, you have a right to claim that. You know, you do. Now, what a lot of people who I see online who who are crit- critical about these ideas is that they like to conflate certain ideas. They like to conflate appropriation with identification. And what I mean by that is they think just because someone says, I am a native person, that they are automatically appropriating an indigenous culture, which I don't think is fair or true because there is no one indigenous culture. There are indigenous cultures and tribes and ethnicities but just to say that your race is native is not an appropriation if that is something that you have a right to reclaim so for me you should be able to reclaim that that's your right but on the other hand there are people who go about it the wrong way for instance the Mashika movement they wanted everyone to be Mashika every mestizo Mexican person to be Mexica but not everyone is Mexica they want everyone to claim Nicantlaca but not everyone is Nawa you see what I'm saying or the Chicanos that like to to put on the Maya or the Aztec calendar on their back in tattoos or it's like that is borderline crossing a line where it's just like you're romanticizing it or the people who say Atlan is you know all of the area that used to be Mexico you're using colonial borders to decide who you are or what you can claim and I don't think that's okay so as much as I think that we are able and should claim our indigenous identity we also need to come out, come at it with respect and know our place in this because we can't just take over or take whatever aspects of indigenous cultures that we want because we're insecure or that we don't know what tribe we come from. We have to accept the fact that we may never know what tribe we come from. However, that does not mean that we are not indigenous people. We have to recognize that colonialism has taken and stripped a lot of relatives, parents, identities, languages, cultures, customs from our people. 
but it does not take away who we are. So when I see the people who are gatekeeping and policing and judging on who can and cannot be Native, I do not agree with that. I just think we need to learn more respect. Because the people who are desperately trying to reclaim our indigenous identity don't do that. They they don't do it in a way in which they should understand because they need to understand that indigenous people, those who know their tribes, those who are in communities, they have the respect for each other in ceremonies and in certain meetings and places when, when tribes get together. It's all about asking respect. It's asking permission. It's all about acknowledgement of the land that you're in and the people who are giving you their time. So if indigenous communities who know their tribe and their identity are the ones putting forth this respect, then us as detribalized people who don't know where we come from should be putting forth even more respect if we think that we need or deserve some kind of validation from our relatives who know who they are then we need to come with the humble humbleness and know our place as people who could be stepping out of line because we're the ones who want to run around and get upset when we're not seen as indigenous by our relatives, but we're also not taking the time to learn and understand where they're coming from. And that's where you see all these problems on Instagram and these debates and this name calling and this words are twisting and all these kind of things. And people think that is unfair for them, but they really don't know what unfair means. So, for people who send me messages asking me how I can help them find their tribe or, or what, what I can teach them, for many, I, don't, I can't give you an answer because I can't even give myself an answer. People who are upset about how I feel and what I identify as, they they keep telling me that I'm speaking over indigenous people. But throughout my whole journey, I've only spoken for myself. I've only spoken for people who have the same experience I have. That's it. Because we are not a monolith and there's no one way to be an indigenous person. There's not. So I only can speak for myself. I only can speak for what I know. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I'm not dressing up in some other tribe's regalia. I'm not trying to claim a tribe that's not mine. I'm just telling you, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. And there's so much I don't know. So it feels weird even to this day for for people to come at me like I'm in a position that that should know things that I don't. And so I only can point people in the path that'll help them grow and decolonize. And for the people who say like, well, now I understand I should not be Latino or, or Hispanic, but I feel weird just claiming indigenous. I think that's okay because it's not a switch you could flip on that changes overnight. It's, it's labor, it's time. That, that it takes for you to learn and understand yourself and your family and your history and your identity. That's, that's something that you have to work on. That's why I've always said, I will never judge or look down on my people who choose to claim Hispanic, Latinx, or Mestizo. I just want to give them the information and the knowledge to be able to choose for themselves. Because 
for the most part, the longest time, our people never had a choice. We never had the information otherwise to understand who we are or why these labels have been given to us. That's all that I try to do on my page is give people the knowledge that I have, give people the understanding I have to be able to make the choice themselves. So, you know, that's, that's, that's really just the goal. I'm not, I'm not trying to be anything else other than Addy. And that's, that's a queer indigenous person who's learning more about himself every day. And I want others to do so as well. So, this is the second time me recording this podcast. The first time there was a lot of mistakes. The microphone went out. Hopefully this time it sounds clear. <laughs> I plan on posting this on YouTube. And uh, if everything turns out good and people listen, I may continue to do so. Uh, I touched on a lot of different subjects and events that have happened that could be their own podcasts in themselves so if there's anything that people want me to talk about in any future episodes uh, just send me a comment in the comment section and you know send me links to things that you would like me to research on so I can talk about or this is just me recording on my iPhone but eventually if people have information on how I can get guests on this podcast and have dialogues that are productive and not not just debates or attacks on identity I'd love to have that um, there's not much else I really think I could say at this point if you stuck around this long thank you um, if you think I'm a hypocrite join the club <laughs> There's a lot of discussions that still need to be had. There's a lot of topics that were discussed that will continue to be debated. And that's completely okay. You can have your opinions. But just don't... Don't come for other people's identity. Just let people live. Let people grow. Let people be... Someone else is not harming you by reclaiming their own blood. And if you think that they are, then that's your problem that you need to fix for yourself. Anyways, um, check out my social medias. I'm Addison's on Twitter. I'm Addison's on YouTube. Addison's and Indigenous Unity on Instagram. And you could follow my page for memes, which is Addy Sons <laughs> with a Y on Instagram. Um, love you guys, and I will talk to you later. Peace.